Hello guys, this is Jonathan Cantwell, uh, ex-Tour de France cyclist, just about to embark on the ITU Age Group World Championships, and you guys are listening to the Physical Performance Show. Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back or welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show brought to you by PhysioCrem and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. As per the intro, the aim of this show is to educate and inspire you towards the pursuit of your own physical best performance. We do this through interviews featuring some of the world's top physical performers and also some of the world's preeminent experts in their chosen fields. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the highs, the lows, and the learnings of our featured guests. And this week, I'll share with you a conversation I recently had with former professional road cyclist, Jonathan Cantwell. In today's episode, you'll hear Johnny share around the highs, the lows, and the learnings of life from within the professional cycling peloton. On today's episode, Johnny takes us through the Genesis story that saw him take to two wheels, turning pro in 2008, and then his Tour de France Grand Tour debut with Team Saxo Bank in the 2012-13 season. Johnny lets us inside the world of professional cycling, what it's like trying to recover, what it's like getting on the bike each day for the arduous Grand Tour stages. Johnny was a lead out man for the team's sprinter, and at one point he finished six on stage four of the 2012 Tour de France. Johnny shares the memories of his top three races and why they were special to him, covers the normal performance round, and opens up as it relates to a recent health scare and also his brother's passing. So if you're a cycling fan or just a physical performance fan in general, you're going to really enjoy Johnny Cantwell on today's episode. And just before we jump to it, at the time of recording, Johnny was just a few days away from representing Australia in his age group at the World Triathlon Championships being held on the Gold Coast. And in fact, as this episode goes live, Johnny will be tearing up the Gold Coast streets, wearing the green and gold, doing his very best at the World Champs. So let's see how Johnny found his way into triathlon and follow the highs, lows and learnings of his professional cycling career. Here is my conversation with Johnny Cantwell. Johnny Cantwell, we've been looking to set this up for a little while, and it's great to finally have you uh, on the call. So thanks for joining the Physical Performance Show. A first question to get you thinking, what's one thing that Johnny Cantwell is learning at the moment? Uh, probably, uh, as everyone knows, I've kind of come from a cycling cycling background, and I've sort of ventured into, uh, into business and the triathlon world. So it's actually pretty funny, even though I've been a professional sportsman for about you know, 10 or 12 years, I'm still continually to learn how my body adapts to certain training and, you know, certain outcomes with, with physical work and training loads and things like that. So <clears throat> it's definitely interesting, even with the history and the sports that I've actually done and, and accomplished, that you still continue to learn probably about yourself. It's probably a good one. Johnny, you mentioned the word accomplished. This show we always say is about the highs, the lows and the learnings of, uh, of athletic pursuit and performance uh, of your professional cycling career what what rates for Johnny Cantwell is the, the highest moment 
of your professional cycling career? It's a it's a good question. Um, and funnily enough, I just got asked this probably about three or four days ago with a with a with a with a friend and a customer of mine in the shop, and they asked me what you know what was the the highest points or the, if you could name three of your best races that you've ever uh, able to start and what your best results were. And fortunately for me, I've, as a younger guy, I was. I always had three races that I always wanted to do. And I think every athlete or cyclist is a little bit different, but obviously for a cyclist, the, the most important race in the world is the Tour de France. So I've certainly, uh, I've ticked that box, uh, even though it was only once, I think once is, is probably enough, uh, in this, in this lifetime for me. So race number one for me, the biggest highlight is, is to get announced inside the team, um, for the Tour de France in 2012. Um, the second and probably the second and third probably go neck and neck really you can't really sort of split them apart is Milan San Remo which is a one day classic um, and then also the uh, the Paru Bay which is also another one day classic and the reason why I say that is because you know they're the biggest some of the biggest one day monument monumental races in in cycling's history and to get a, to get a start into those and then also again to finish uh, both of those races and I'm not too sure if people can sort of think back to Milan San Remo 2013 where it was the really really cold day and it was like minus five for most of the day and there's a bit of a, a photo circulating around where the little cycling cap underneath my helmet was totally frozen I had an ice particle coming down from my chin so three highlights of my career Tour de France Milan San Remo and Paris Roubaix and Johnny you know the tour, the France. You know it's 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 the golden haired child, and to get that start, I'm just fascinated. What was it like, stage one? I'm not sure. It must have started with a, I imagine maybe a prologue time trial that year. Start but with a prologue. Yep, yep. You know Saxo Bank team Saxo Bank. You're on the start line. You're at the starting gates for the the opening prologue. This has been a a boyhood dream now coming true. What's going through your head as you're about to take the first pedal strokes? The prologue of the the Tour de France 2012. Yeah, yeah, Bray. It, it was a childhood dream, and I think it's it's for a childhood dream for for many cyclists to, to try and get a start in that. But um, being on the the prologue, uh, we started in we started that uh, the tour that year in Liège. Um, it didn't actually kick in. Like, I mean, I didn't get announced onto the team. We didn't have Alberto Contador um, riding the tour that year, so it left um, it left the team selection to be what we classify as an opportunist team so we had some good one day uh you know breakaway specialists we had um chris anka Sorensen. we had uh jj hayato who is a very good argentinian sprinter who i was actually leading out so we definitely had a very diverse team but it didn't kick in that i was actually doing the tour de france until i was literally clipped into the pedals and the guy was holding the the time the tt bike up behind me and then he's like you know counting down from three seconds is probably when it actually kicked in that i was literally about to start the tour de france on the start line and then that tour i remember i i watched as i think most gold coast gold coasters that are in the world of endurance sport followed your your tour that year closely there was a heavy fall i recall in one of the uh i think the, the more final stages that year uh can you take us through what happened there i, I just recall seeing johnny cantwell slammed up against a wall <laughs> uh yeah you're 100 percent right brad i had a i had three pretty bad crashes uh all within two days believe it or not um, so the major stage, um, sorry, the major crash that I did was actually on stage five. So it was very early in it on the tour. Uh, it wasn't towards the end. Um, it wasn't towards the end until I was actually really suffering from, um, the, the, the aftermath of the crashes. But stage five, I got caught. I was leading out. It was about three kilometers to go. Um, obviously at this stage, we're probably sitting on around about 65, 68 kilometers an hour right now. And, I had JJ on my wheel. Um, Saxo Bank's never really been renowned as a sprinting team, so for me to have him behind me, leading him out, was um, was a huge privilege and, and a lot of responsibility. Sometimes a lead out guy was, you know, sometimes has a harder role than the actual sprinter. So just making sure he's in positions. And long story short, I got caught up between um, it was Cavendish and Sagan. And um, we all know that they're, you know, any sprinter is, is relatively aggressive. And then Tyler Farrar, so I was kind of sitting between Cavendish and um, 
and Sagan, and, and I was basically sitting very pretty there, and, and there was no gap whatsoever, no space at all to even look and think about going, and, and Tyler Farrar decided to, to try and make a gap. Um, then we've I've overlapped Sagan, Sagan's gone down to the right, I've gone down to the right, and the uh, I essentially just hit my, the pedal hit the kerb, and just somersault and flipped me over the handlebars at about 65k an hour, um, and probably did around about four or five, maybe six commando rolls, and um, a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> brick house stopped me. <laughs> um, again, there's another a bit of a funny photo circulating where the lady is just standing there with her shopping, looking down upon me as I was at her front door. And she was kind of like saying, you know, what the hell are you doing here? Let alone did she know the Tour de France wasn't even going by. Uh, <laughs> so that was a bad crash. And luckily I came away a little bit unscathed, to be honest. Wow. But what actually had eventuated was I did fracture my fibula. Actually, so I did get pretty hemmed. I fractured my fibula in my right ankle. And if I if it had been a running race, I wouldn't have been able to start the next stage. Um, but you know, luckily I had a little bit of luck on my side and I was able to, to ride the bike, which was good. So it wasn't too much pressure. Um, and then unfortunately what happened was it moved my cleat because my cleat had actually hit the ground and hit um, the curb that it actually moved and shifted my cleat around um, and threw my knee out. So about four or five stages later, I was actually, yeah, really, really worse off. And I remember... Um, probably around about five or six stages in um but i said to nick i said mate i've i'm i'm really in all sorts here we're going through the neutral zone so the neutral zones you know it goes for january and about 10 kilometers before the race actually start and i was pretty much going out the pipe in the neutral zone um and i said i came back to the team car and i think biana was uh, nick was driving biana reese was in the passenger seat and i said mate i'm just i'm, I'm struggling what do i do what do i do he goes you got two options, mate. You either finish or you pull out. Up to you. <laughs> so I think, you know, Nick Gates has always been known for his, you know, directness. He's very black and white and he's very raw, which is what we've uh, come to love about him. Um, and there was no way in hell I was pulling out of the tour. So uh, soldier on and, and basically yeah, get, get through day by day. And, and that was one of the things. We had some a lot of experienced riders inside the tour that particular year with, you know, Chris Anka Sorensen. We had Carsten Kroon. Um, Nikki Sorensen was also there. Guys that have ridden, you know, five or six of these things before, you know, I even thought about even contemplate doing one. And they were fantastic inside the team. They, they mentored me. They helped me. And it's basically – it's a race where you take day by day. Um, and that's what I physically did. I literally did day by day. I didn't think about the stage after the, the one I was currently doing um, and just tried to soldier on and do the best I could to, to get to Paris. And Johnny, uh, for listeners' benefit, you know, Nick, uh, being Nick Gates, uh, the team director there for Saxo Bank at the time, and he was way back. Your episode's 127, Johnny, and Nick's episode on the show was episode 17. So there's 120 uh, episodes between you guys. But uh, okay. what was it like rolling across the, 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 the finish line there uh, in Paris? First Tour de France. Being a bit battered and bruised along the way? Yeah, definitely a battered and bruised. And um, I mean, and absolutely physically. I was I was spent. I mean, I remember some. I think stage sixteen or seventeen. I got to, you know, the the restaurant, the dinner, and um, my body was that depleted and that physically fatigued that I couldn't even actually look at it, look at even eating dinner. So that kind of my body my body was rejecting food at that stage. So it's definitely a big feat. But um, I mean, the thing with Paris, it's you know you know you've made it. So even before you hit the Champs Elysees. Um, you know you've you've accomplished and you finished the Tour de France. It's a very cruisy, relaxing ride into into Paris, and I remember very vividly that around about 10 kilometres to go before we actually arrived onto the final circuits, you could hear the crowd. I mean, you've got a hundred odd thousand people like lining the streets um, in Paris, and the roar that was coming because they knew we were so far, we were so close to to arriving that. I remember that vividly. I mean, like even thinking about it or talking about it right now, I just remember that that roar, that echo coming into even 10 kilometres out. And then arriving um, into the France Elysee, we, it was funny. It was really funny because everyone's like, you know, cheers and toasting. Everyone's cracking jokes and talking about their experiences and how they almost didn't make it and finish, et cetera, and, um, and everyone being kind of enemies 
during the tour with different teams. And then that particular day was everyone was just relaxed and chilled and everyone could talk. But then entering the Champs-Élysées, it was kind of like, okay, this switch has just gone from red, which is cruising mode, to green mode. <laughs> it's it's on again. And I remember that we arrived and, again, we we had to do a job and that was to lead JJ out. And um, But, yeah, arriving there was something that I'll never forget. It'll never be uh, taken away, which is which is cool. Um, and then also arriving on the front of and saying, "Okay, it's game on." And then my job was to to finish JJ, uh, place him into a good position, and then um, uh, and I remember actually on the front of with about three k to go, I was actually I let out with probably two and a half till around about fifteen hundred to go. So I was on the front, which was quite an experience, and dropped him off. And I think JJ finished I think third on that particular stage. So. Yeah, we had about three or four top tens or top sorry podiums for JJ. So I'd like to say my job was done for him. But um, definitely, definitely a spectacle and definitely a life experience that I'll I'll treasure and hold on to for the rest of my life. And I mean, backing up day to day, that's what intrigues the public: the intensity, you know, the ardour of it. I mean, were there days, obviously, aside from the falls, where you just just didn't want to ride that day, and you're just willing yourself to get back on that bike throughout a tour, yep. grand tour? Yep. It kind it kind of does become a little bit Groundhog Day. Um, the one thing, and, and that's a very common question people ask, like how do you get back up? How do you do 200k? How do you do that kind of thing and continue? I, I mean, when we're preparing for the tour, you're you're kind of doing this day to day. It's not very often you're having days off during the week, so you're kind of getting up to 100 kilometres a day. Obviously, the intensity is not there and things like that. Um, but I mean, you kind of you're well prepared to to go in there, and obviously you do struggle, especially you know coming from the Gold Coast and being a sprinter when you're faced with uh, you know Alpe d'Huez and the Tourmalet and the Glibier and things like that. It's it's definitely no um, you know it's no Springbrook. Um, <laughs> so I mean, you, you just you just got through, and and it's very it's a very mental game to be completely honest and, and it's, it's life is a mental game and at the end of the day you've just got to prepare yourself mentally and, and you know you've got to back yourself you're there and you've got an opportunity and you just push through and, and I remember Robbie McEwen actually um, saying to me this is even way before I was riding with Saxo he said um, every time you have an opportunity to not pedal and every time you have an opportunity to, to drink and recover you take you take that opportunity um, so you know that 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 resonated and sat with me for pretty much a lot of my career. So I mean, you know, going into the sprints, you always look at Robbie when he sprints. He's he's pedaling, but then any, any chance he gets to coast or draft, he'll do that. And I kind of uh, took that on board, and that's what you kind of do. You've you've got to continually eat. Um, you've got to continually drink, even if you're not hungry or you're not thirsty. It's about what you're doing during that particular day that's going to benefit you for the next day and the day after that. So whether you're not hungry or thirsty. You just force yourself um, and you remind yourself. So I guess it comes part and parcel about being a professional athlete. You've just got to do those certain things to, to not put yourself in a, in a predicament with days to come. You're listening to Johnny Cantwell, former professional road cyclist, sharing around the highs, the lows and the learnings of his sporting career. Support for today's show comes from Physiocrem. Physiocrem is a topical cream containing natural plant-based ingredients, ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates. It is clean to use and pleasant smelling, with the smell fading away in minutes. Its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocrem can be found at chemists and health stores Australia-wide, as well as their online shop. They're offering listeners of the Physical Performance Show 20% off all Physiocrem products. And that's simple to redeem. Jump over to physiocrem.com.au. That's F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M. And there you can use the promo code POGO, capital P-O-G-O, and get your 20% off your Physiocrem supplies. Hurting sucks and Physiocrem have your back. Support for today's show is also brought to you by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to cross their physio finish line. 
That's where we high five you and celebrate that you finish rehabilitation and you are back to your physical best. Now, in addition to traditional session to session appointments, we offer some unique models of care, all designed to help you save money and recover faster. And these include our award winning 2, 6, and 12 week fixed fee, unlimited, that's right, unlimited access, finish line programs, and also our monthly fixed fee wellness booster packages, where from a low $195 per month, you can receive physiotherapy, remedial massage therapy, active rehabilitation, and also use of -of state-of-the-art rehabilitation equipment, such as the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill. To find out more, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. But for now, let's jump back to Johnny Cantwell on the highs of the lows and the learnings of a professional cycling career. You know, we talk about the highs, the lows, the learnings. Uh, the, what's the, been the darkest or lowest day in your professional sporting career? Obviously, you're now in phase two, pursuing age group triathlon with the world championships on our doorstep <laughs> very soon, representing Australia and obviously your, you know, your role with Swift Carbon. Uh, but you know, what was the lowest, the darkest day in Johnny Cantwell's professional sporting career? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um... Two, two uh, occasions spring to mind um, relatively quickly. It's, it's kind of when a professional athlete knows they're either coming to the end of their career or their career gets taken away from them or a team shuts down or something like that. Uh, I remember back in 2010 when um, I was racing for Fly V. Um, uh, it was a very successful team. We raced really well in Australia. We raced really well in Asia, and we absolutely dominated America. I uh, had about 103 race victories in those three seasons with that team, and and I had an opportunity to join a Euro team then. Um, and then I don't know if you remember that that Pegasus team arose, um, which is still sort of operated by the same the same um team and things like that behind closed doors so yeah that team pegasus is when i signed my first big european contract um McEwen was on the team we had a lot of really really good riders and it was going to be the first australian professional team and uh everything was set up ready to rock and roll and then i remember sitting down at nobby surf club actually with robbie and he's like mate there's not good news um 15th of december 16th of december uh, Robbie got the inside word that the team was not going to get funded and we had the sponsors um, weren't going to be present and the team was going to f- was folding. So, I mean, my first real big professional outfit um, was over before it even started. So that was one of the, 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 the lows and that comes in. A lot of athletes have experienced this and, and a lot of athletes have gone through it and it's not a very nice feeling. Um, and then probably when um, when my when I when I lost a job with uh, with JPAC was probably at the end because I mean I moved everything back from Europe and I had I had an opportunity to stay in Europe and race with various teams and and I took a punt with JPAC um, and unfortunately that didn't didn't pan out the way that I would have liked it to and and um, so they're, they're probably the two most horrible days that have yeah. You know the high, the, the lows in, in my career is, is when you yeah you know your career's ended or coming to an end or you know not getting rehired or something like that. So unfortunately that happened to me on a couple of state uh, a couple of occasions and again it happens in a lot of sports. It doesn't matter what sport it is. It's just the part of um, being an athlete um, that you just take it with a grain of salt and you just you know you I've been a, a a kid that's grown up in the Gold Coast sort of fighting since he's 15 years old. So for me. Uh, you know, it, it, it obviously impacted me a lot. Um, but I mean, you know, you've just got to press on, you know, you gain, you just can't, you can't let it define you. You can't let it rule your life and put you in a, in a, in a bad direction or a bad outcome. You just got to make the most of the situation and press on with life, basically. Johnny, before we throw over to the learnings, the highs, the lows and the learnings, just you mentioned uh, just your background. You, you've been fighting since you were 15 year, years old uh, on the Gold Coast. What were those formative years like and how did you find your way onto the onto the bicycle? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I sort of keep my life relatively um, uh, relatively private, um, but, I mean, I, you know, I don't showcase everything that goes on with, with life and stuff and behind closed doors, but, I mean, 
Um, yeah, unfortunately, my father passed away when I was 12, uh, 12 years old. So I, you know, I kind of grew up with um, under the guidance of my mum, and I sort of she moved away from the Gold Coast when I was about fifteen years old, and um, essentially just put the boxing gloves on and, and started making my way through life. Um, working, um, I started working in a, in a local bike shop called Cog Hogs back at Burley. Burley, I don't know if you remember those days. Um, and then, yeah, just went into the, left school a little bit earlier than what I would have, um, well, I left school sort of around about year 10. I was f- sort of moving out and, and fending for myself when I was around about sort of 15, 16 years old and, and just had a, just, I guess I was fortunate enough to have some drive. Um, always wanted to be a sports person at some degree, whatever it was. I mean, I just always, um was fortunate in life that I was gifted with a sporting ability. So whether it was AFL or golf or cycling, I, I, I was, I was fortunate to be good at it. Um, and then, you know, once you went through the QAS program, made the Australian team, um, with just with, with various results and things like that. And just, just pushed myself as a young guy to, to basically say, you know, it's, it's do or die. There's no one to, to do it. So if you don't, do it yourself then no one else is going to do it for you and there's no point dwelling about the past and things like that because it doesn't really it'll either define you in, 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 in a good way or it'll define you in a bad way and for me I just made a choice um like an individual personal choice to you know continue on and, and try and make something of yourself and um do it on your own so to speak and, and so were there, was there anyone that came alongside you and really spoke into your potential and gave you that galvanized your confidence and your belief in yourself or was that always inherently within you you knew you could do it um i've, I've definitely had people along the way that have that have believed in me um and again, being very fortunate to have people on my side to, you know, to to somewhat give me a little bit of direction, a little bit of guidance. But it was definitely in, inherited in me in some um, some way, shape, or form. So, um, I mean, I think you, when you grow up a little bit tough and you see a few things that, you know, you probably shouldn't experience or something no one should experience in their life. Um, I mean, you just you just grow up tough. Like my mum did it a little bit tough, and then I I started following in her footsteps to a little degree, and and just got on with it. But you know, I can I can definitely say that I had you know a couple of people through my younger life say you know do this and do that, um, and give me a little bit of guidance. But I you know I'll definitely take a little bit of credit where it's due there for sure. Yeah. So definitely your background, you know, gave you a, a lot of depth there in, in how you, you know, you approached your, your professional career and the tenacity required to do the arduous of professional cycling. Johnny, let's do a performance round. So this is sharing some learnings, some rapid fire questions. Training sure. session you most dislike and then the training session you most like. I definitely dislike training in the rain. It's one thing you I've never been a big fan of, just because your bike gets dirty, the chance of getting sick, and the chance of you crashing. <laughs> um, the, the days that I like is motor pacing sessions. Yeah, feel fantastic after them. Who's the athlete Johnny Cantwell most admires and why? Um, so in today's Tiger Woods as a golfer, um, you know, he's a very dedicated, very disciplined golfer uh, i'm a big fan of golf love golf playing playing golf since i was a young fella obviously we know he's made a few mistakes in his previous uh life which i wouldn't <laughs> don't uh condone but um uh probably probably tiger Woods as a golfer johnny is, is there or has there been a mantra that you use or some regular self-talk you've got on loop when you race or compete no i don't best recovery tip Put your legs lie flat on the back on the ground and put your eggs, legs in the air so you recirculate the blood flow coming down from your feet. Beautiful. One word to describe your racing style, Johnny? Fast and aggressive. <laughs> we'll give you two. How would I'll Johnny, give you two. <laughs> yeah, how could we not? How would Johnny Cantwell <laughs> describe being in the zone? What's that like? It's all, it's all about seeing the um, finish line. For me... For me, I was a born, I was a born racer. I was a born competitor, um, so I definitely look to to do two things. I look to deliver results, and I look to um, push myself to a greater limit, do or die, so to speak. Johnny, what's the hardest session you've ever done or you ever did in your professional cycling career? As a race or a training session? Go for a training session. Hardest training session I would have done would be training in um, uh, at altitude 
with Saxo Bank in 2013 in um, uh, just trying to think where the, where the place was called again. It was up in the uh, up in altitude in between the border of Switzerland and Italy because the altitude I never I never responded well to altitude. So there was days there that I thought I should end my cycling career. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that session like a, a you know repeat uh, hill hill intervals or what was it? Just a long ride or intense ride? It was. Yeah, it was long rides, and when you're training with sort of Alberto and <laughs> Rafa Mica, and you know you go in there in the form of your life, and you basically go out the tail in the first kilometre. I mean, you just look down at your legs, and I mean we're we're climbing at 3,000 metres altitude, and you know I'm laying down 230 watts, and Alberto's doing 450 or whatever it is. I had a good hard look in the mirror when I finished the stages, and I said, "Is this really me?" <laughs> uh, but that would be it. Johnny, finish this sentence. The most important thing in life is family what drives you johnny to work hard again family and survival and johnny where does pressure come from myself johnny let's throw out of the performance round and if you could boil everything you've ever learnt for your sporting career to date and now your successful transition over into competitive age group triathlon racing and open triathlon racing uh, what would you say would be the one bit of advice you'd give to help people pursue and perform at their physical best if you could only give one bit of advice johnny what would it be always think about doing the one percenters and every time you can do that one percenter it's going to give you a better chance of achieving your goal the one percenters matter right absolutely johnny personality question everyone loves to get behind the personality of the featured guests so fun (laughs) question three people at a dinner table living or past who would be at johnny campbell's table and why very tough question let's go for someone with the music category i've always been a huge fan of uh someone like a johnny farnham um sounds a little bit weird but i mean i'm a huge (laughs) fan every all my gold coast People know that I'm a huge Johnny Farnham fan. He's just, <laughs> he's just a genuinely good bloke. Yep. If it wasn't him, it would definitely be Jimmy Barnes. Uh, I'm just in the middle of reading Jimmy Barnes's book, and I mean, you know, what a what a character, um, what a human being. So uh, let's go with one of those two guys. Um, as a sports per- person, maybe Rory McIlroy. You know, he's young. He's sort of um, – he's definitely dedicated. He's uh, – he just seems like a good guy to, to be around. Um, and then let's go with uh, David Coulthard as a Formula One, ex Formula One driver. So that's a very, uh, it's a mix of athletes and uh, musicians. That's fascinating. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's my life. I mean, there's no point in me meeting the president or anything like that because that's probably not going to change my views or anything. <laughs> um, so anything to do with sport because we'll definitely have uh, sport and music. We'll definitely have some similarities and something to have a conversation about. That's terrific. Johnny, you transition out of professional sport. It can really be a tricky transition for pro athletes. You seem to have, from the outside looking in, have adjusted to it very well. You've got the the Swift Carbon bike shop there in St Kilda, Melbourne. But what's that transition been like? And and where can people sort of follow your journey and find out a bit more about Johnny Cantwell? Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And um, whether it's common knowledge or not, but I mean, the transition from being a professional athlete, especially for a, a lengthy period of time, into, you know, the working world, the business world, or just society in general, is always always a tricky transition. People that I've spoken to in, in all walks of life and all different sports have said, you know, it takes around about three years for people to get back into it. Um, you know, I'm no different to anybody else, that is definitely for sure, but I guess one point of difference would be is, you know, being through that survival mode um, um, as a young fella growing up, you know, you've always got to have your finger on the pulse because you never know where um, things are going to lead, you never know, you know, where your next meal is going to come from, so to speak. So, I mean, for me, it was definitely a little bit of an easier transition. Um, I had a good opportunity to join Swift Carbon um, on a global level um, and merge that deal between um, that Draypack cycling team and Swift Carbon when I was coming back into Australia. And then transitioning um, back to Australia, having that brand sort of uh, in the background and then still racing was quite a nice little transition. Um, and then just just again having self determination and I mean if I wasn't cycling anymore there was no chance of me going back to Europe because once your career 
you, you move your whole life and your whole family back to Australia, it's kind of you can't go back over there. So it was a bit of like, okay, well, you're at a crossroads now where you just need to really sharpen the pencil and and make the business successful and sustainable. Um, and it's been it's been quite it's been challenging. The bike industry is definitely um, a tough industry to be involved in. Luckily, you know, I've always worked inside of bikes. So, you know, I used to run Teshner Bike Company back in Australia. Um, if you remember those guys with Peter Teshner. Um, and then I worked with um, with Blair Stockwell at Life Cycles for about three years, sort of late, late 90s. So I've always had a familiarisation uh, and definitely a love for the bike industry. Um, so when Swift... Uh, came on board and, and, I, and I did my you know my research with this company and saw where they were going and, and for me to be able to be in control of my own destiny with the brand inside Australia it was a little bit of an easier transition and you know I was racing for the first you know six months of the the season with Draypack and then we uh, we had a handful of staff under us here in, in Melbourne we opened up a concept store so I was I'm classified uh, essentially as the distributor for Australia for Swift Carbon um, and they've just, just recently gone, uh, they've had a buyout actually. So it's actually, the brand is not South Africa anymore. It's actually made, um, well, the brand is, uh, Portuguese now. So in Porto, Portugal is where the brand head office is now. Um, and then just continuing on with the bike industry, it's, it's just all about growing. It's all about adding new elements to the company. So I started a wheel company called Speed Pro which is a premium carbon fiber company, which we predominantly do, you know, wheels and handlebars and componentry and things like that, um, which, you know, goes hand in hand with the with Swift Carbon because, you know, every bike has to have a set of wheels on there. Um, so, uh, and then Matthew Goss and I, who are really, really good friends, we've known each other for a long time. He's now uh, a partner and develop um, guy inside Speed Pro. So two ex-Tour de France cyclists, have started uh, Speed Pro Cycling, which is which is very interesting. It's like um, it's it's nice to see that because we're still in love with the with the sport, if that makes sense. We still love cycling. You know, now that we're not racing, you know, with cycling, so to speak, we're still involved by producing high end products that we would cla- that we would want to ride through our cycling careers. So now we deliver that to the general public now, which is cool, even in athletes, etc. So Swift Carbon and Speed Pro Cycling is uh, is where my business lies right now. Yeah, and we'll certainly tag all you know the links up in uh, in the show notes uh, for the listeners there, cool. Johnny. You're listening to Johnny Cantwell, former road professional cyclist, sharing around the highs, the lows, and the learnings of his career. If you missed last week's episode featuring acclaimed Australian sports doctor, Dr. Peter Bruckner, former Australian cricket team doctor, Liverpool football club doctor, and also Collingwood and Melbourne AFL team doctor, then Peter shared around his recent book, A Fat Lot of Good. And this is an episode not to be missed if your health matters too. You and I know it does. In this episode, Peter shared around the low carb, high fat lifestyle or way of eating, why we need to reduce our daily sugar intake, and Peter further debunked many of the dietary myths that pervade our way of thinking. Here's a little snippet of what you missed, and be sure to jump back and tune into the full episode featuring Dr. Peter Bruckner as an expert edition. Okay, I'd have uh, proper labelling on food, so I'd have front of packet labelling with uh, with teaspoons of sugar. So I'd have a te- teaspoon of sugar uh, on the front of every uh, of every food label, and, and I'd have a number in it, and uh, that told you the amount of sugar that was in that uh, in that food. So uh, if you had a 900 ml bottle of uh, Master Foods barbecue sauce, it would have the number 125 on it. So 125 teaspoons in a large bottle of sugar in a large bottle of uh, of barbecue sauce. So things like that. For now, let's jump back to Johnny Cantwell, former road professional cyclist, on his highs, lows and career learnings. Johnny, uh, triathlon, it's grabbed you... uh by the horns, by the looks of it, and you are about to represent Australia in, uh, in the World Age Group Championships to be held here on the Gold Coast in just a few days' time from this episode going live. So what's your expectation there? Your other competitors must be a little bit nervous when they know there's an ex-Tour de France cyclist in the field. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you had said to me six months ago, hey, Johnny, you're going to be doing the Worlds on the Gold Coast, I just would have laughed at you, Brad. <laughs> Why is that? Um, to be honest. I, I just it's it's one of those things. Um, I mean, I, again, I've always that competitiveness comes uh, comes out. I'm 
only 36 now, so I don't really feel like I'm over the hill by any stretch of the imagination. Definitely not. Um, but I've, def- I've definitely got some fire in the belly. Like, my career got ended before I was ready to end it. So I guess there's a little bit of unfinished business, if you will. Um, definitely some fire in the belly. Um, I've also gone through some health battles um, in the last couple of years, which, you know, when you get presented with... Um, you know, uh, I'm not too sure if you're aware, but I went through testicular cancer about two and a half years ago. Um, and then for me, that was, it was a huge wake up call. Again, it was a, it was a life lesson. It didn't, it didn't change a lot in regards to my drive and direction and my passion for the sport, but it also meant, it, it also sort of settled into me or resonated that, I mean, this life can be over before you know it. So many people have, have had tragedies. So many people have, have known someone to have tragedies and things like that. And I mean, for me to experience that firsthand was like, shit. I mean, I've got to, I've got to do everything and I've got to do it now. Um, don't sit around and just think about doing things, get out and, and do it kind of thing. Um, so the world of triathlons, it was, you know, I, was, I, I did a few crits and things like that when I when I basically went into retirement and still wanted the race. It's good for the brands and the businesses. And then did a few triathlons. I'm involved with a few triathlon, triathlon groups down here in Melbourne. And, you know, I used to run through school, so I've had a little bit of a running background, which is okay. Um, being from the Gold Coast, I mean, if you're from the Gold Coast, you're already, you know, you can just swim. It's just you're born to swim. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I was with Surf Life Saving Clubs and so forth when I was a when I was a junior, and then um, and then obviously my bike my bike my bike history is, speaks for itself. So, I mean, I'm like, you know, what am, what am I going to do? And I did a couple of these triathlons, and I went through a really really tough, um, really really tough mental challenge towards the end of uh, last year when my brother passed away, and you know that really threw me in a, in a tailspin. Like everything was going along okay, I was doing some you know, some training and I was, you know, concentrating on business and things like that. Uh, and then when my brother passed away in October, I, I really went into a tailspin, like massively. And I basically needed sport to pull me out of that. So, I mean, like sport for me has always been my, you know, my go-to place. Um, I think for anybody, sport is just such a, a, a release on life. It's, it, it can make you focus. It can um, – it sets – objectives it sets goals for yourself and so for me i'm like okay i need to you know target something and i need to pursue something again um so i can get out of this tailspin and then um so you know some friends and some colleagues of mine said you know why don't you try out for the for the age group world champs for the triathlon olympic distance i missed the sprint qualifying races um unfortunately otherwise i would have done the sprint and the olympic distance um so i said yeah absolutely so i set out a bit of a calendar set out a schedule um certainly left things uh a little bit late because um essentially how it works brad is you've got 10 qualifying races around australia in around about a five month period and you've got to do three of them to accumulate points and your best three so you can do 10 of them but you'll only accumulate points on your best three. And me being me, I left things a little bit late. Uh, well, I didn't really know. So I left things late and I only had three races to go. So for me to have any kind of look in or any kind of chance of qualifying, I had to do the three races, the three last races. So set myself a challenge. I had to go to Canberra. I drove to Canberra, raced and drove home. And then I had to drive to Adelaide about four weeks later and race in Adelaide. Uh, which I ended up winning. That was a state championship. So I won that and qualified or well, accumulated the most amount of points. And then the last one was actually in St Kilda where um, – so Swift Carbon's head office is. And I ran fourth in that. So with Canberra, Adelaide and St Kilda, I accumulated enough points which positioned me around about sixth uh, in the qualifying um, list. And when the email come through saying, you know, you've made you've made the team and you get to wear the Australian things, I mean, it's it's just it's it's very rewarding. You know, I've sacrificed a lot, my family sacrificed a lot, and a lot of time and effort has gone into it to do that and to be rewarded to represent Australia. And I think for me, one of the the biggest, um, I guess, sweeteners of the whole thing was that it is on the Gold Coast. You know, so you know, there were definitely 
well, I hope I don't know if they'll definitely, but I hope there's a half of the Gold Coasters out there cheering me on and and uh, and pushing me across the finish line. So, fingers crossed, it goes to plan. Absolutely, Johnny. Thanks for sharing there as well. And obviously, your brother will be uh, top of mind uh, as you cross that finish line. I suspect. Definitely, mate. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Johnny Cantwell. Uh, finally, every guest gets to issue listeners with a physical challenge for the week. What's Johnny Cantwell's <laughs> physical challenge to listeners going to be? Physical challenge, uh, that's a good one. I mean, most people I would presume that would be listening to this are somewhat involved with cycling and things like that. So why don't they set themselves a challenge? So I'll challenge you to challenge yourself, if that makes sense. So why don't you set yourself a goal, uh, a challenge, so kind of exactly what I did. I, you, know, you don't have to go and try and do the world champions by any means, but, I mean, if your goal would be to ride 100 kilometres for the first time, then why don't you try and go out there and, and, and set it set it for yourself and go out and accomplish it and try and set it within a certain time limit so you actually motivate yourself, push yourself and make yourself a little bit accountable. Fantastic. Johnny, if people want to uh, reach you on social, where can they find you and follow the journey on social? Um, yeah, just like everybody else, well, I've got Facebook, which is just my name. You should be able to find it. Um, Swift Carbon's got Facebook. Um, Speed Pro Cycling has got Facebook. Uh and Instagram, Instagram, social media handle, everyone's got that. And um, please feel free to reach out, send me a message, uh, and I'll do absolutely everything I can to uh, to respond. Johnny Cantwell, appreciate your time. I know you're under time pressures today with uh, everything leading to the worlds and work today and family and training. So thank you for your time and uh, and go get them uh, at the Gold Coast in, a, in what will be. It might even be going live this episode on the day that you race. Do you race on a Thursday, Friday or Saturday? Uh, we race on a Sunday just before the pros. All right. Yep. Well, this so, will be out three days ahead of your race. I'll be there on the Sunday uh, doing some work behind beautiful. the scenes. So go Johnny Great. Cantwell. Looking forward to it, guys. Cheers. Thanks, Brad. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust you enjoyed today's episode featuring Johnny Cantwell. If you did, then please let Johnny and myself know. Johnny's easily found over on social media or Instagram at Jonathan Cantwell, and that's Jonathan with a J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, Cantwell, C-A-N-T-W-E-L-L. Myself over at Brad underscore beer on both Instagram and Twitter. A big thanks to you, the faithful listener, for your ratings, reviews, and also for subscribing to the Physical Performance Show from your favorite podcast player, whether that's iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or whatever else you download the show through. Thank you. Special thanks to Faithful Show listener, Over 63673, who rated the show's five stars on iTunes and commented, great and unique insights from many interviews. Some episodes are too long, but you can fast forward through these. Seems to be written for fitness freaks and ultra athletes, but I'm an ordinary Joe and I still get a lot out of it. Somewhat inclined to defy successful athletes, which can be excessive. Well worth trying this out. Go for it. Over 63373. Thanks for taking the time to leave a review and your feedback matters. And absolutely, I am aware that some shows go well beyond 60 minutes and some shows come inside 60 minutes. So um, I hope if you are tuning in, you find the length okay, dependent on the guest. But appreciate the feedback and the review. And if you'd like to jump over to iTunes and leave a review, then please do so. Rate it one to five stars. It's simple. Just it's simple. Just click ratings and review from your favorite podcast player and rate away. A big thanks to the team who each and every week make the Physical Performance Show possible. Susan Wilkin, Administration, Matthew Walding, Graphic Design, and Daryl Misson, Audio Engineering. Of course, another big thank you to PhysioCram for making this show possible. Don't forget to order your PhysioCrem products and receive 20% off over at the physiocrem.com.au shop by using the promo code POGO. And don't forget to go into the draw to win an incredible PhysioCrem pack, which you can cite by jumping over to at Physical Performance Show on Instagram. And there you can leave your name and details in the URL to go into the draw to win a great PhysioCram prize pack. (laughs) 
coming up on next week's episode of the Physica Performance Show, we keep the two wheels theme going, where I bring you a conversation that I had earlier in the year with Troy Herfoss. Troy Herfoss is one talented athlete. He is the Australian Superbike, Supersport, Dirt Track, and Supermoto champion. And Troy, only a matter of of a few days ago, took out yet another Australian Supermoto title on the motorbike. In addition to that, Troy himself is also a very talented cyclist. And in next week's episode, he shares a story around the Road Nationals where as an unsponsored solo rider without a team, he led the Road Nationals up until the penultimate moments of the race. So you won't want to miss next week as Troy Herfoss shares his highs, lows and learnings. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.